Hello, everybody. Welcome into another edition of the Computer America Show. Yes, it is Friday, and in the afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. in our new time slot. Um, we have a terrific show planned for you tonight. Our good friend and buddy, Ralph Bond, is here with us for both hours. Ralph is with Autodesk, and he uh, finds some really great stories and news and topics for us to talk about. So for both hours, sit back, relax. We also have our uh, uh, social media winner of the week. We'll be announcing that as well. So it should be a fun Friday show here on Computer America. Stand by. One minute until showtime. Twenty seconds. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into another edition of the Computer America Show. It's the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And it is Friday! As we say, another week of broadcasting excellence in the file cabinet. And, and, and uh, we have a terrific show planned for you. Uh, today, on today's show. Again, uh, we are on, I say today because we are now live Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So you can watch us live. We used to be on uh, 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 10 to midnight for so long, for 20 some odd years. Uh, the show has been, uh, will be in national syndication for our 25th year in February of uh, 2016. For for anyone who doesn't know why we switched over, it's actually because we are, uh, you know, on, on the show, host, co-host, we, you know, do all about computer technology. In our non-air time, we are avid tomato farmers, and <laughs> our crops were just getting such terrible yields from the time of midnight and working around that. Those it, darn tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. So, you know, we're finding our, our crops are getting larger, and, you know, luckily, we are finding a lot of people are actually enjoying our new 3 to 5 afternoon time. So, you know, nice side effect. Yeah, and here's a little personal insight. I love tomato ketchup, tomato soup, tomato juice. I don't like tomatoes. Go figure. You know, I just, all the... the where you because everything you just named has <laughs> added sugar after the fact. I see. Well, even if I put sugar directly on the raw tomato, I, I wouldn't like it. Trust me. It's, it's, Have <laughs> you tried that? That actually sounds pretty good. No. No, I have that, not. That, that sounds like you're taking all the nutrition out of a very nutritious thing and just replacing it with sugar, which it sounds like something you'd like. Y you know, you know, that was it the pilgrims used to call tomatoes the devil's apple. You know, they, they thought it was bad for you. But go figure. Anyway, a little little uh, aside. Uh, yeah, all those nutrients. Oh man, <laughs> devil fruit. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> But uh, anyhow, it is Friday, and since it is Friday, that means we're going to have a social media winner of the week. Mm -hmm. Some lucky person is going to win a really nice prize from Logitech, the uh, Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse valued at $80. We'll be giving that away to someone probably in the second hour of the show, as we usually do. And uh, um, 
let me just uh, give out the incidentals. If you have a comment or a question about anything that myself, uh, Ralph, or uh, Ben are talking about, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. 347-884-8881. That's 347-884-8881. I'll get you on and get you through. All right. Uh, if you don't want to go on the air, you're radio shy, we, we have another mechanism. Uh, you go to our website at computeramerica.com. Any page in the upper right-hand corner, it says submit a question. Just click that. It'll take you to our question submission page where, where you can just type in your comment or suggestion or question. Click the submit button and both Ben and I will see it immediately. And we can ask or, or bring it to the air, our, our audience's attention. Okay. Um, the other thing that we also ask you to uh, participate in, it's completely optional, but we'd love to, because we're a radio talk show, we also stream our live video now. You can actually watch the Computer America show. The way you do that is go again to any page at computeramerica.com. In the menu bar that's on each page, you'll see it says uh, Show Lounge. It's the second item from the left there, right next to the Home option on the menu bar uh, on the website. And um, just click the Show Lounge, and you will be immediately taken to our, our, our video streaming page. It'll start up automatically, and you can watch it. You can see myself. You'll be able to see Ralph, and you'll be able to see Ben. Uh, ben will be displaying... Uh, using the technology that he, ha that he has, all the things we're going to be talking about on today's program. Uh, you'll see websites, you'll see links, you'll see videos. It just makes it for a more interactive experience, and uh, we certainly invite you to uh, participate in that as well. Uh, of course, you if you miss any of it, you can also go to our archives page at computeramerica.com. We archive our audio and video there as well. Uh, we are now heard on SoundCloud, and we're also heard on Stitcher carries the archives of our show, so you can do that. We also have our own YouTube video channel. All the links are there at ComputerAmerica.com, so you can see all these things and listen to all of our, any of our programs. But we enjoy having you here live. It just makes things more spontaneous, more fun, more interactive. It gives you an opportunity to call in or submit a question, if you will. Now, the other nice thing is that Ralph prepares, takes the time to prepare what we like to call lovingly, the cheat sheet, the cheat notes. Uh, and if you go to computeramerica.com and you will see right there when you click on Ralph's picture, uh, you'll, it'll say, uh, click here to see the cheat notes. When you do that, it'll open up a Google Docs document that you can look at and you'll see all of the things we're talking about on today's program, uh, the images, pictures, descriptions, and importantly, website links will be there. So you can actually follow along with us on the show and enjoy all the things because Ralph takes time takes some time from this to prepare that and uh, it's up there the the uh, the show it's the cheat notes uh, that Ralph provides for you our listeners and uh, we just like to share that with you as well okay well if that's uh, enough I think I'm gonna just bring Ralph onto the program unless there's anything else you want to mention Ben before no, we no 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 I think you covered just about everything okay well good let's bring Ralph on yeah yeah he's back that's his theme song. Bond is back, and we've got him. It's all Bond on today's show. He's Bond. Ralph Bond. Ralph Bond is a correspondent for the Computer America show. He's the author of Family Computer Fun Digital Ideas Using Your Photos of Movies and Music by Q Publishing. He's also a co-author of the PC Dads to Becoming a Computer Smart Parent by Dell Publishing. Ralph was Intel's Consumer Education Manager for more than 10 years, and for nearly the past eight years, he's been a part of Autodesk's communications team. Ralph, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Hey, it's great to be with you guys, and not to start things off on a somber note, but of course, this is 9-11, the okay. anniversary, of course, of the, the terrible tragedy, and just want to say that at the time, it happened. I was spending about half of my time in New York City on behalf of Intel working on some projects there. And I wasn't in the city when, when the event happened, but I was there probably about a week and a half or so after, and I'll never forget what the environment was like in New York City at that time and, and the many months that followed. But at that time, week and a half, almost two weeks after, I took the subway to the Fulton Street Station, got out, and uh, boy, guys, it was a completely bizarre experience. Yeah. The the rubble was, of course, still there. There were plumes of clouds still 
emanating from the, the rubble. Mm -hmm. And it smelled like burning um, aluminum pop cans. If you ever, as a Boy Scout or kid, threw a soda pop can into the fire just to see what would happen, the kind of thing little guys do. Yeah, that weird smell, and, and uh, it was just uh, crazy. And I'll never forget uh, Intel told us, it said, go home to your families, ask them if it's okay if you go to New York uh, because we realize it's a very stressful situation and sat around the table with the family. My daughter looked at me after I s explained the situation. She said, Dad, you have to go because we can't let the terrorists win. And yep. wow, I was so inspired by my own daughter. <laughs> I tell you. But lots of memories and boy, other stories I could tell you about the endless police and firemen funerals that I saw in the city over the subsequent many weeks. And uh, what a day. But prayers and thoughts for the survivors and prayers and, and thoughts for the heroes and, and poor victims of that terrible day. Yes, absolutely. From all of us, also here at Computer America. Right, right. Have, have you seen the, uh, the monument given by... Uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Putin. It's no. uh, to to the struggle uh, to the struggle against world terrorism monument, huh. and it was given by Russia. It resides huh. in New Jersey, I believe. Oh wow! Here on anyone looking at our video screen. Oh uh, look at that! Yeah, it's it's one it's uh, one of the two towers with a giant metallic teardrop right oh, down the middle, wow. and wow. all the uh, victims on the uh, onyx. Uh, you know, bottom down there, inscribed in stone. So, wow. yeah, I, I I never even heard of that monument, but it uh, I think it was put there in 2002, and it's just something I, I never heard about until today. I, neither have I, and I think it's really a powerful thing. I, wow, that's a shame that I I certainly didn't know about it. I bet a lot of our listeners and many citizens of our country are not aware of that either. That's a, a very beautiful tribute. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and again, you can see that on on, on the. Uh, a video feed from Ben's video. Right. Is right. Okay. Um, well, uh, um, I think we should move on at this point and get into the program. Uh, right. Ralph, uh, as I said, picks all these different stories. You can follow them on our cheat notes. And uh, let's get to it. Uh, the first story is a, a, a really an amazing one. Mm -hmm. that a completely paralyzed man... Uh, was uh, able to voluntarily move his legs, according to the story, uh, the source from the UCLA newsroom. Uh, this looks some, like some exciting stuff. What is it all about? This is really a great story. And again, folks, this is the once a month I get a chance to do something I can't do anywhere else, and that is command someone to do something. <laughs> so, listeners, unless you're driving a car right now, I command you to go and get the cheat notes because friends as Craig was explaining it really enhances the experience of our show what I do is I go out and I, I find fun and interesting stories and I'm kind of keen especially as Ben and Craig know on health and technology stories and this fits that category so with that said uh, this comes from UCLA University of California Los Angeles their newsroom issued a press release the headline was completely paralyzed man voluntary voluntarily moves his legs UCLA scientists report and so it's a really great story in the cheat notes we have links you can go and see the whole story more pictures and so forth the, the photo we have in the cheat notes the caption is robotic step training and non-invasive spinal stimulation that's a key point non-invasive spinal stimulation enable patient to take thousands of steps and then the, the press release talks about a 39 year old man who had been completely paralyzed for four years was able to voluntarily control his leg muscles and take a thousand steps in a robotic exoskeleton device during five days of training and for two weeks afterward a team of UCLA scientists reported this week when the story was filed uh, this is the first time that a person with chronic complete paralysis has regained enough voluntary control to actively work with a robotic device designed to enhance mobility. So there's your important milestone here. Goes on to say, in addition to the robotic device, the man was aided by a novel, non-invasive spinal stimulation technique that does not require surgery. Wow. Very important, right guys? Mm -hmm. His leg movements also resulted in other health benefits including improved cardiovascular function and muscle tone. Wow! The uh, new approach combines a battery-powered, wearable, bionic suit 
stop for a second. Think about this. Over the past couple of years, fellas, that we've had stories about, remember the one about the robotic accentuating exoskeleton for naval workers working right. on ships that allowed them to continue working for hours and hours? Friends, check mark, take note of this, bionic suits to help the disabled or to help workers to give them superpowers. This is not fantasy anymore. This is reality. So again, the new approach combines a battery-powered, wearable bionic suit that enables people to move their legs in a step-like fashion with, again, a non-invasive procedure that the same researchers had previously used to enable five men who had been completely paralyzed to move their legs in a rhythmic motion. So they had done some preliminary stuff where they could get people to do rhythmic motions, but this was the big breakthrough with this fellow. Uh, that earlier uh, achievement is believed to be the first time people who were completely paralyzed have been able to relearn, key point, relearn voluntary leg movements without surgery. The researchers do not describe the achievements as walking because no one who is completely paralyzed has independently walked in the absence of a robotic device and electrical stimulation of the spinal cord. Uh, I know this is a long story, but it's so important, guys. I think I want to keep going here. In the latest study, the researchers treated a fellow named Mark Pollock, who lost his sight in 1998 and later, poor fellow, became the first blind, blind man, pardon me, not uh, jumping ahead of myself. So he lost his sight in 1998 and later became the first blind man to race to the South Pole. Now here's the uh, part that's unfortunate. Uh, in, and, go ahead. Uh, I, 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 I know it's going to be a little off color, but I'm going to say it. Uh, <laughs> first blind man to race to the South Pole. He was actually just trying to go to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big achievement, though. I, you know, it's got. I think I remember the story about this guy back in 1998. I think it made a big national or international news. And it goes on to say, in 2010, Pollock fell from a second-story window, poor guy, wow. and suffered a spinal cord injury that left him paralyzed from the waist down. So not I mean, bad he's enough. He's totally blind. blind right? He's blind. Then he falls in and, and becomes a quadriplegic. Jesus. Oh my lord! Isn't that terrible? So at UCLA, Mark Pollock made substantial progress after receiving a few weeks of physical training without spinal stimulation and then just five days of spinal stimulation training in a one-week span for about an hour a day. Now if you know about um, rehabilitative therapy and so forth guys that's a pretty compressed therapy a training schedule if you're, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that world and then it says the procedure used a robotic device manufactured by Richmond California based ESCO or EXO -E -X -E SO for exoskeleton, I'm sure, exobionics, which captures data that enables the research team to, deter to determine how much the subject is moving his own limbs as opposed to being aided by the device. Great story. It's like an onion, layer upon layer of importance and significance to this story, not least of which, guys, the advent of exoskeletons for the able and disabled. So, wow, I just love this kind of stuff. Wow, I I'm still blown away by the fact that he lost his eyesight and then became. Yeah. I mean, how much more horrible stuff happened to the human? <laughs> well, obviously, if if you lost his eyesight and said, you know what, I'm gonna go do something that most people never do in their lives, and well, yeah. he 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 seems like just the kind of person that would want to go through this kind of experimental therapy. Yeah, yeah. Salute to him, a real pioneer for the disabled. Believe me, that's true. And, and huge kudos to the researchers at UCLA. Good for you guys. This is just so exciting. I, I just love this stuff. I kind of want to have these guys on the show because, you know, uh, uh, Exobionics, they do have a website, and I'm sure we can contact them. They, I think you should. Yeah, they, they seem like right up our alley. Oh, I bet it would just be a super fascinating story, to say the least. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. Okay, well... Um, uh, for all the football, <laughs> this next story is kind of interesting. Um, uh, you know, if you ever, ever has gone to a um, you know spring training or, or the, for a football uh, uh, practice, um, evidently uh, one of the things is that when they practice tackling, they either tackle another human being that, that puts two people at risk. Evidently, robots are now replacing humans uh, by, by becoming tackling dummies <laughs> but but it's it's not quite as what you think uh, tell uh, tell us about this no tackling dummy sounds exact I, I think it's exactly what most people think when they hear tackling dummy okay <laughs> is it a tackling dummy or are you tackling dummies <laughs> 
<laughs> hey Ben, if you can fire up the video that's in oh, the yeah, link sure, there sure, because sure. it's hilarious. I mean, it is. Remember, well, Craig might remember. I don't know about you, Ben, but when I was a little guy, we used to have these inflatable clown things. Why clowns? Mm, Weeble wobbles. Yeah, Weeble wobbles. Yeah, and they had the sand in the base, right? And you could just go and you know really work out your therapy and aggression. <laughs> Just you know, knocking the you know what out of this thing. <laughs> it reminds me of the uh, the Wii game where you have the nunchuck and the device, and you're you know punching the heck out of the guy. <laughs> anyway, so this is from uh, <clears throat> Engadget. Headline is Dartmouth's robotic tackling dummy is a mechanized Weeble Wobble. The toy I was referring to. Story by Billy Steele, by the way, in the show notes. I forgot to put his name in there. My apology. Uh, and Gadget Story. You can see the great image and the video is to die for. It's just awesome. So it says, robots are replacing humans in lots of roles. But at Dartmouth, a robot may soon replace tackling dummies during football practice. Designed by engineering students at the Ivy League school. Don't you love it? Designed by the students. Mobile virtual player. Everything has to have an acronym, right? MVP. Yeah. Not most valuable, mobile virtual player uh, gives training sessions a more realistic feel over those regular old stationary bags, right? Mm -hmm. It's also looking to reduce the risk of head and neck, neck injuries. This is the important part of it. What's more, it's remote control. There's still work to be done, though, as the team behind the MVP is working to make the controls easier for coaches to use and the robot's maneuvers more realistic, hopefully. They're also installing a kill switch so that when the tech gets fed up, it doesn't start wrecking fools on the gridiron. <laughs> and we put the uh, video link there for you, and I encourage everybody to go and check it out. I, I think it's really kind of a super clever thing, especially in terms of reducing injuries from just practice, for heaven's sakes. Maybe we'll just have a bowl. Let's have teams of Weebly Wobblies nice. playing each other. That's <laughs> what we should have. You know, let's go to robotic football. <laughs> oh, my God. Um we're not even gonna get into the uh, into the, the 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 injuries that happen at football. Oh yeah, terrible actually. It's yeah. a serious topic. <laughs> um, okay, well let's move on to this next one now. For those of you think of of uh, um, installing uh, uh, hurricane windows in your home or something, well we've got something even better. Uh, there's evidently this self-healing material that will actually handle a bullet, uh, which is uh, uh, I guess the ultimate um, <laughs> kind of window. Uh, this looks really interesting. Tell us about this. Yeah, this is another story from Engadget, this time by a fellow named James True. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing the name right. And the headline is, Watch this self-healing material handle a bullet. Got a little image there from one of their test videos uh, where it's a very you know sl high frame rate so they can show you sequentially how this works. But the story says, NASA-funded research has created a material that could self-heal in seconds. Mm -hmm. Two layers of solid polymer sandwiched a, uh, sandwiched, pardon me, a gel that with an ingredient that solidifies on contact with air, in specific when one or both of the outer layers is damaged. Wow. It's a little hard to conceptualize. You have to see the videos. You have to look and study more. But it says this differs from other approaches that rely on a mostly liquid compound or similar slower techniques. The protect, uh, protective applications in space are obvious and could add a vital line of defense against dangerous debris, so debris colliding with, uh, with windows and so forth. Uh, the ISS already has shields to protect it, but reactive armor in the event of damage would be even more reassuring. It concludes by saying, back down here on Earth, the same material could be used in cars. I don't know about the PIPS, I'm not sure what the reference is. There are containers and even phones. Now, wait a minute, that would be good. My, my wife, bless her heart, she dropped her iPad mini and just hit the angle right and shattered that Gorilla Glass. Oh. How cool would it have been if it could have just set it down and let itself heal? Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, yeah 150 bucks later, we got the glass replaced, but uh, and they did a beautiful job. But nonetheless, this is a really interesting thing for because I think what I love about classic stuff developed for NASA, you guys know this from your history books, NASA has everything from Velcro to today. <laughs> NASA technology has come into the real world and benefited us in a huge way, and this may be one of those ways it's going to happen with this self-healing uh, glass material. Yeah, I, never, 
I never knew how destructive it could be in space. I mean, I, I don't know if you ever watched that movie with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. Yes. <laughs> it was the, um, I can't, I'm blocking the name Gravity. of the movie. Uh, Gravity. Yeah. Gravity. Gravity. Uh, yeah. When Gravity. Debris is, it, you come in contact with space debris, you know, that's up there, because let's face it, there's a lot of stuff that we put up there. Oh, you know, yeah. And that hits, it's like bullets. It, it, it doesn't just Gently bump you. These things are moving at incredible velocities. And will shred. <laughs> you're getting this from a movie? No, it's true. But it's true. I mean, it's well, anyway. all but movies are scientifically grounded, aren't they, Ben? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Well, yeah, but this one was, and 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 the point is that uh, uh, I mean, you could really see how you know yeah. that things in space can. Now, really I have heard of this story before, and I did hear some comments, you know, kind of shout out saying, "Oh, good, they're going to use it in the space station." Where this gel comes in contact with air and it solidifies and repairs itself. Good no. thing air is so flexible out in space. Like, oh, you know, well, it, that's a good point, Ben. I hadn't thought about that. Wait a minute. <laughs> and then I think Oops. others also kind of said, you know, if, if there was some kind of rapid decompression, then the air would, you know, come from the inside and seal itself up really quick. So they're hoping that. But, okay. Okay. And, and and people are just kind of questioning, uh, you know, just just the. The viableness, the viability of of this application, but honestly, it it sounds like a nice safety precaution. Like it, it it's better than just a one solid thick piece of glass. To have that gel in there, it's just an added safety precaution, and yeah. it sounds you know very very nice. Oh yeah, yeah. And and by the way, since we mentioned, since wait a minute, Craig mentioned the movie Gravity. Mm -hmm. I am now going to walk through the chainless door of exploitive opportunity and tell you that it was Autodesk software that was behind the special effects. Our software was used by the special effects people for that film and it was a triumph. I mean, if you've, if you've seen the film, it's a jaw-dropping, amazing film in terms of computer-generated graphics, not just for wild fantasy stuff, but to really try to recreate the experience of orbiting the Earth and all the things that happened in the film. So, uh, that's one for us at Autodesk that we're very, very proud of. So, and you obviously saw the picture. I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. Gorgeous. Drop I mean, it, dead gorgeous. It, it was amazing. It, it received all kinds of awards. But, uh, it did, uh, yeah. Really, you really do get a feel for what it's like up there. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. And and it's so, once again, it's a it's an old broken down fiddle here. But the, the state of the art for computer uh, graphics is such that to, to distinguish real from real is kind of impossible now. Yeah. It's just astonishing to me. Except you know, some of the things were suspended by these little invisible wires. You could sort of see them dangling there. But <laughs> I'll tell you what, it makes you, uh, on the eve coming up here of the next Star Wars film, yeah. go back and look at those ni the first 1975 one. Mm. And rem remember, it was handmade models, and mm -hmm. some guy banging on an, a cord, holding up a telephone pole to get the sound of the lightsaber. All the the things that they had to do, the hand done things they had to do with that day and age, make you appreciate what a triumph the yeah. the, the, the first film was. <laughs> Back yeah, the practical effects were you know they're that's why they they hold up so well. It's oh, gosh, yes. CGI from back in, from back in those days was atrocious, but practical effects were very, very good. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's move on. Uh, this next story, um, uh, uh, fluid motion allows a robot to use 40% less energy without losing speed. Right, right, right. This is uh, this caught my eye. Uh, first of all, I'm kind of interested in robotics. I know you guys are too, along with the health technology and some of the other things that are my pet subject matter, uh, and 3D printing too, of course. This is a story from geek.com, great outlet, folks. Matthew Humphreys wrote this story, and uh, let's get into it here. It says, if you've ever watched an industrial robot in action, it's clear to see that they are very fast, very precise, and very repetitive. They can work much faster than a human doing the same task, and scaled up, it can produce as much more efficient uh, production line. However, their efficiency is surprisingly not great when it comes to energy use. Research carried out at the Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden discovered that those quick stop-start precision movements of a robot actually waste a lot of energy. So think about the robot dance, right? Where you go, 
Well, you might be accurate, but it's these jerking movements they're talking about. It's the inertia because they have to. They go there and then they have to stop immediately, and so they're overcoming the inertia to do that. It, it, it eats into the energy level. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. So it's it's it's. You think about again. I'm being a little facetious, but the amount of energy probably due to the robot dance in a jerky fashion, as opposed to a, a ballet dancer who's fluidly moving, is it would be the same same kind of thing. So it says here, the good news is. It's quite easy to fix the problem by introducing fluidity of motion. Instead of movement that uses very quick acceleration and deceleration combined with long stationary times, an optimization algorithm was developed and used that reduces the speed individual movements are completed without impacting the overall speed of the robot's task. Mm -hmm. The order in which movements are performed is also optimized where possible. Now there's a link in here for a video to go and see this. Watch, so, I'm watching it now. There you go. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, as the video shows, large spikes in energy use, a, use are removed through this optimization. Multiply that factor or pardon me, multiply that for a robot operating 24-7 and then by thousands of robots, and the energy savings are clear. In fact, up to 40% energy savings can be realized with a minimum of 15% being touted. So it's a minimum of 15, but up to 40, and any energy saving is uh, in the, that range is worth doing. If the same results can be seen in the real world, real pardon me, world setting, then manufacturers will jump on this and adopt it into their operations. 40% energy savings could easily translate to tens of thousands of dollars in cost savings at a large manufacturing facility every year. And also, and, not and, mentioned in the article, but see if you and, agree, uh, I think it would be wear and tear. Take a little break. And then we'll continue on. This is the Computer America Show. Ralph Fon is here with us uh, for both hours. We'll be right back. A new statistical review from Marty Winston also. Stay with us. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. I want to tell you something about VTech. They always have the coolest telephone systems around. VTech's new four-line small business phone system, the perfect solution for small business owners that need to install a phone system that has qualities and features that have previously only been available for companies with bigger budgets. First of all, this new system is the most affordable and easy to install four-line phone system on the market. Its components allow the system to grow alongside a business up to 10 extensions that can be located anywhere. The four-line small business phone system also comes equipped with a number of advanced features such as auto attendant for each line, a digital answering machine with mailboxes for every extension, full duplex speakerphones, music on hold, power failure operation, six-way conferencing, and much, much more. The VTEC four-line small business phone system is available in stores and online at Office Depot, Office Max, and Staples, as well as online at www.vtechphones.com. Tell them I sent you. No, mine was a Chambord milkshake. Oh, hi, it's Marty Winston with a new Stiff's Bullet Review for Computer America, this time the Nora Lighting Edge-Lit LED Fixture. Once we all deal with new bulbs and old sockets, LED lighting is all about fixtures that get installed once and last for longer than you're likely to own the place. Nora Lighting sent us their Edge-Lit LED Fixture for review, and wow, we're impressed. It's a two-foot square panel with an even corner-to-corner -corner glow. It uses 38 watts total for a diffuse, even light that's brighter than 460-watt bulbs. 
it also has a high color rendering index good quality white yes it's dimmable down to five percent and yes they offer other sizes and color temperatures here's the capper a fifty thousand hour life expectancy at three hours per night that's 45 years Bottom line, edge lit LED lighting panels from Nora Lighting are great lights with great expectations for maintenance, free longevity. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. No, 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 not this hour. Next hour. Calm down, folks. Relax. Yeah. Next hour, we'll be giving away that great Logitech mouse, uh, the MX Anywhere 2 mouse, uh, and we'll be giving the way to a lucky social media winner. Uh, Craig, do you know which social media outlet you have chosen the winner from? Twitter. From Twitter. All right. So we know that if you did not sign up to Twitter, then you did not win. Sorry, <laughs> folks. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to do that in the second hour. And here in the first hour, and actually in both hours, Ralph Bond joins us as per usual, second Friday of every month, to talk about great stories that he's found. And we were uh, right in the middle, or uh, actually we were, we were just uh, getting into the story about fluid robotic motion and how it can actually save energy on uh, on these robots because you know if you've ever seen uh, any kind of manufacturing robot they have very jerky stiff stilted movement and that obviously is you know the the, the motion side revving it up really fast doing the task and then revving it down really fast to you know complete the task so you're going to get a, like a lot of power waste in there um, because you know obviously there's a difference between human motion and robotic motion, humans didn't exactly evolve to be the most wasteful, so, you know, humans get that fluid motion as opposed to robots. So, uh, yeah, Rob, you were just about to uh, pose a question to our audience or something Well, yeah, what, ben, ben, the thought I had at the end here, and see if you guys agree with me, and I'm sort of evoking the spirit of my my father, who was a mechanical engineer and a chemical engineer, but anyway, on the mechanical engineering side of, the, of my father, it occurs to me that if you have this more fluid motion versus the you know robotic dance herky jerky move, movement, wouldn't that reduce friction, guys? Which in turn would reduce wear and tear on these robots in certain key points. What do you think, guys? It seems to me that would be a logical conclusion. I, I, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, it reduces a lot of things: the friction, the inertia, all of, all things that consume energy. That's what they try. Right. And these things that consume energy would uh, that basically would be uh, uh, reduced by quite a bit. So the only thing right. I can think of is that they, they said they said that they actually slowed down, you know, the, the, the movements of the robot and you know to help create that uh, you know that that smoothness. And as long as it gets the task done in the same amount of time, then that makes perfect sense because uh, you know in certain situations where you have these robots, you know energy waste isn't really an issue. It's getting the task done in, in manufacturing, in car manufacturing, in housing manufacturing, just things like that. It's how fast can you get the job done? Can we make our quota? Right. And you know, I could see where energy savings is taking a back seat as opposed to efficiency. So as long as the efficient, efficiency doesn't go down, this seems very, very promising. Agree. All right. Well, um, let's. I want to move to. I want to skip over story five, and I want to go to story six. Um, okay. Which I think uh, is really interesting, and I, I saw this, uh, and at first when I looked at it, I I, I thought it was <laughs> a window, uh, but actually, what you what, what the picture, and if you're watching this on the uh, video feed, you'll actually see a picture of this truck from Samsung. And yeah. Um, what they've done, we all know what an 18 wheeler looks like. It's a big truck, and when you get when you get close to it, it's literally like driving behind a wall. Uh, you can't. Uh, one of the things you learn, you know, when you drive is what they call reading the road uh, to anticipate what's happening in front of you, and you really can't do that when when you're behind an 18 wheeler, and especially if you're on a on a two way lane highway or you want to pass the vehicle, you run the risks of you know not being able to see what's around the truck and right. you're stuck with it. Well, what Samsung looks like they've done is they've taken a huge display, a video display, and put it on the back of the truck as part of the truck. And uh, this is very, very cool. Tell us about this. Yeah, I, I do. I, I love this. And, and I have to say, when we went to Ireland a year ago, <laughs> and the, the European Union built some beautiful freeways for those folks, and that's great, but you get off those freeways, and you're on these tiny two-lane roads. In fact, 
what you see in the picture of the cheat notes, half of that would be a two-way road in most of the Irish countryside. So I immediately thought about the horrifying experiences that we had driving around <laughs> Ireland in the countryside. But I digress. So this story is from Geek.com, a story by Matthew Humphreys. The title is Samsung Safety Truck Uses Huge Display to Allow Safe Overtakes or Passing, right, in traffic. And it's a really interesting, I, I kind of, to be honest with you guys, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about it. I, I get the safety idea, but on the other hand, you might find yourself distracted by this giant display. But I think the intent is admirable, and it's an interesting application of technology and an indication of how the reduction of cost to make large flat panel um, displays such, as such makes this kind of thing a, a viable possibility in some cases. But here's the story. It says, many drivers encounter the nightmare scenario of being struck, uh, pardon me, stuck behind a truck hooked up to a long trailer traveling slowly along a single lane highway. You have two choices in this situation. Continue to get frustrated and sit behind the truck or take a chance, and that's the key, and attempt to overtake it without knowing what the oncoming traffic will be like, unless you kind of do that little inchwormy bit out and in and out and in until you can see. Uh, it's a decision that can cause a lot of stress and sometimes an accident, but Samsung thinks it may have a solution in the form of a huge display. The so-called Samsung Samsung, if I could say it, safety truck has a very large display consisting of four panels built into the back doors of the trailer. This is linked up to a wireless camera embedded in the front of the truck. A video feed of what's in front of the truck across all lanes of the highway is displayed to any vehicles following behind it. That way, they can make an informed, the drivers can make an informed decision as to how safe it is to an attempt an overtake. Uh, the video, which you can see here, and I think Ben's been playing for you, uh, it even works well in the dead of night thanks to the truck's headlights. Samsung says the technology works, it just needs to figure out whether different laws governing use on highways allows it to be fitted on commercial vehicles. Another problem that needs to be considered is vandalism. How are the displays protected from being stolen, smashed, or damaged in some way? For example, graffiti. A lot depends on how exactly they are embedded in the trailer doors. The camera in the front of the truck also needs to be kept clean. It's a good idea, and I do agree with this. It's a good idea regardless of the potential issues of real-world use. Hopefully, Samsung gets to the roll, gets to roll it out soon, and it really shouldn't cost that much to add to the trailer of trucks. The technology being used here is already in widespread use and therefore relatively cheap to deploy. But you know what I worry about, guys? I worry about what if the there's intelligence built into this and it says there's no oncoming traffic, so I'm going to show an advert on the back of this thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could see capitalism creep in and, and, and you know, mess with this, but, but seriously speaking, it could be an interesting uh, usage model, maybe. Yeah, I, I just thought that you know there'd be three cameras or you know three monitors displaying what it should be displaying, and then the fourth one is you know playing South Park or something. It's just <laughs> getting them all synced up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's room for error, of course. <laughs> or you'd have ticker tape banner ads, you know, <laughs> on the bottom. Don't miss Craig Crossman, <laughs> Peter Maria. <laughs> right. And, and like. It's a nice idea, and obviously Samsung is a manufacturer of said monitors and said TV displays, so obviously if they feel like every single truck had to be outfitted with, you know, four, eight of these, they stand to make a lot of money. So, oh, you sure. know, you of course have to see this from what they're trying to get out of it. But I feel like there, there's there's other better solutions, or at least other lower technology but higher efficiency. Like, what if you just put a sensor, and yes, they make sensors, a sensor that would detect cars, you know, to the left and, you know, on two-lane highways, and then just on the back, you know, a, a yellow light or a green light, and just, you know, make it so no cars coming, cars coming. And, you know, just a simple light system, I think, would do essentially yeah. the same thing without all the television. Exactly. That's oh. great. But those lights can be confusing. I mean, you have tail lights of all different colors now on, on, on trucks. And how do you know which which? Well, then make sure if people. It's it's clear that it's an offset piece of technology where it's like, hey, cars coming. Like you can put words, cars coming. You know, if if you think it's too confusing. Yeah. Well, now, look, I'll, I'll offer an alternative idea. Mm -hmm. Not so much a moving display, uh, because it, and my idea that I'm going to offer doesn't address the challenge that they're trying to do here with the Samsung truck. 
but we all know what it's like to be in smaller country roads or something where where you have a, a blind curve or something and you you don't know what's around or uh, there's a feeder road into a rural road and it's blind kind of wouldn't it be cool to have displays possibly solar powered maybe mm-hmm. right that would show you critical things so you could kind of see we we in the country here in Oregon I'm not too far from the countryside they have those kind of chrome uh, dome like mirror-y kind of things that help you see things sure. but what if you had a cool LED display uh, again, solar powered, so it could be independent of electrical lines and all that sort of thing. That could help show these sorts of things. I don't know, you know, so, and it would be sensor driven, so that it only comes on when a vehicle is approaching, so to help a vehicle, and then it just shuts off to save power when not. So there's a lot of different possibilities for the, just the idea of how can we use flat panel displays in a creative way for safety relative to driving. So there's another idea. Yeah. I, well, I, mm-hmm. go ahead, Greg. No, no. There are all different types of ideas, and that, and all of them have merit. Uh, but you know, and uh, I don't think there's any one idea that that's flawless. Everybody, everybody, what? Yeah. There's one idea that's flawless. <laughs> Ben's idea. <laughs> no, no, not even that. Self-driving cars takes all the safety out of it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Self-driving cars, of course. Hey, it, it it works. The cars will talk to each other. They know exactly where they are. Much safer than humans. I I am a huge advocate of self-driving cars. Yeah, that is a good that's, that is a good idea. And and uh, self-driving. Uh, commercial trucks, uh, sorry, out there, truck drivers, and the disruptive technology that it is, but uh, you know they they already have self-driving semis on the road today. Mm-hmm. Okay, Ben, I'm going to see your idea and take a science fiction, raise the stakes on you for a Go second. For it. We talked about exoskeletons a moment ago. I just had this thought. I do have thoughts once in a while. <gasps> oh my God. Uh, what if you had a future where you know how you you can go into urban areas and you can do those rent a bike for a while, right? Mm-hmm. What if you could? What if you had a situation where everybody in the population—I mean, this is pure fantasy—before they left their house to go to their job, say in New York City, busy sidewalks, right? What right. if they all got into an exoskeleton suit, and in turn, all these exoskeleton suits for pedestrians are communicating like autonomous vehicles, and you could just run like crazy because the exoskeleton is <laughs> helping you to run, and you could get to work super fast on foot, so to speak, without colliding because it would all sync up with the traffic lights and everything, and the, and the cars and everything, and just, you'd be going around. Now, there's a sci-fi thought for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, technology-controlled crowds. Uh, it it sounds weird, but, I mean, there's a lot of research that went into crowds and how to best you know direct them and things like that. It's not out of the... You know, it wouldn't be out of the question for technology to enter <laughs> every part of our lives, and commuting is a place, you know, be it walking, driving, biking, whatever, technology is going to take a lot of commuting stress out of it. Yeah, I think we just came up with a great script idea for a sci-fi police drama where the next born the, movie, the, uh, the, next the born hero movie. gets into his police exoskeleton and gets out into the general population, but everyone's moving really fast. You can get to the crime scene fo- super fast by foot because of this <laughs> autonomously controlled thing while the vehicles, too. So, you know, anyway, Hollywood, did you hear that? I think it'd be a fun premise. It'd be and a great then, visual of course, thing. And then, of course, Hollywood is going to have those Luddites <laughs> that are standing out there. It's like, man, I have my sneakers, and I walk there, and all these robot people are messing with my natural walking rhythm. It, <laughs> you know, the, the people who don't like all the technology. Like, right. <laughs> And then it's, then then you got to bring in Chappy. Oh, Chappy, run! <laughs> I see we're getting way out of control here. So. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> bring it back in. Bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> All right. So you're listening to Ralph Bond. Uh, he's with Autodesk and some of the stories that he has found for us. And uh, uh, we're getting back to reality. So let's <laughs> question this next story, which is um, a harness. Uh, oh, actually, a leaf. More specifically, an artificial leaf that harnesses sunlight for efficient fuel production. Yeah, yeah. It's another. I love these out there science stories, right, guys? This is a, this is a kick. This comes from Science Daily, a great outlet, everybody. And again, the show notes give you the link. Uh, There's a story issued by the California Institute of Technology, and uh, you can see a little image there, and you can see a caption for the image, and there's a good caption there. But let me give you the story. It says, generating and storing renewable energy, such as solar or wind power, is a key barrier to a clean energy economy. When the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis 
of course the acronym JCAP, was established at Caltech and its partnering institutions in 2010, the U.S. Department of Energy, of course an acronym DOE, Energy Innovation Hub had one main goal, a cost-effective method of producing fuels using only sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide mimicking the natural process of photosynthesis, if I could say that, in plants and storing energy in the form of chemical fuels for use on demand. So that was the goal. So it says, over the past five years, researchers at JCAP have made major advances toward this goal and now report the development of the first complete, efficient, safe, integrated, solar-driven system for splitting water to create hydrogen fuels. Mm. Drum roll, please. Wow. The new system consists of three main components, two electrodes, one photoanode, and one photocathode, and a membrane. The photoanode uses sunlight to oxidize water molecules, generating protons and electrons, as well as oxygen gas. The photocathode recombines the protons and electrons to form hydrogen gas. A key part of the JCAP design is the plastic membrane, which keeps the oxygen and hydrogen gases separate. If the two gases were allowed to mix and are accidentally ignited, an explosion can occur. The membrane lets the hydrogen fuel be separately collected under pressure and safely pushed into a pipeline, a critical component that contributes to the efficiency and safety of the new system is the special plastic membrane that separates the gases and prevents the possibility of an explosion while still allowing the ions to flow seamlessly to complete the electrical circuit in the cell. All of the components are stable under the same conditions and work together to produce a high performance fully integrated system. The demonstration system is approximately one square centimeter in area, that's what's shown in the photo, converts 10 percent of the energy in sunlight into stored energy in the chemical fuel and can operate for more than 40 hours continuously. So this, you know, checkbook here, the check mark rather, well there was a checkbook behind this too I'm sure, but a check mark on history folks, uh, this is important. Uh, it's really a very interesting cool thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It is very different. Uh, you know, we're always looking for uh, other ways to create cheap and effective energy. Right. And it certainly looks like to be yet another alternative. There's, there are so many of them out there. Who yeah. knows which one's going to make it, you know, too. And maybe it'll be a combination of more than one. Okay, yeah. Debbie Downer. The, the only thing I can say, though, <laughs> is that it, it says, you know, a lot of the, as, as soon as you read, you know, along the ions to flow seamlessly, the only thing I could think of was, like, Man, I just wasted all my ions with that Ionic Pro air filter. It just sapped all the ions out of my air. What? Does anyone remember that thing? Yes, of course. Oh. It made yeah. it like after a rain. Right. It's like where where did those things go? Like they were advertised everywhere back in the mid two thousands, and then they just went away. Oh, they're in the they're in the uh, bin with the pet rocks. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> hmm. No, but very cool technology with, with the with the artificial leaves and yeah, very interesting. Technology borrowing from nature, though that, that seems to be that, that's a, what I like. Yeah. yeah, on a roll lately. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the part that I find really fascinating because obviously, duh, our trees and other photosynthesis things out there in nature are just cranking away, making energy like crazy, and why not mimic that? I mean, they obviously, you know, plants have figured this out already. <laughs> yeah, for a couple hundred million, if not a billion Billions years. So. Years, yeah. <laughs> don't don't need to reinvent the leaf. Right. Oh, <laughs> that's very true. All right, um, I want to go to this next story because uh, this is something. Uh, now, when you think of a uh, New Mexico, you know I think of or <coughs> I think of a uh, alien craft that, and <coughs> strange things that you discover. The aliens, you get a Craig. They're choking him to death. Oh no, yeah, they're choking him to death. But you know, <laughs> but. but here we are in Alagor uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico. They find <laughs> buried in the New Mexico desert not alien artifacts, but unearthed Atari cartridges. 
and get this. That's what's. I mean, that's one thing. But they're going to sell them for a hundred and seven thousand nine hundred thirty dollars and fifteen cents. I want mean, to believe that this is the second, like the second crew got it. The first crew accidentally <laughs> died because it was an Ark of the Covenant type opening of this horrible <laughs> video game. Just destroyed everyone because these games should have stayed buried in the desert. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. What a great story, huh, guys? This is from Ars Technica. Story by Megan uh, Guess, and it is a funny story. I mean, I just, just. What stopped me in my tracks? I said, "Wait a minute! I gotta read this," for many reasons because I'm old enough to remember playing all these crazy games and stuff in the cartridge games. Oh yeah, that was really cool. And you can see that in the show notes they show the picture here. So um, it says here the city of Alamogordo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Will get a sixty-five thousand dollars from the sale of the unearthed Atari, Atari cartridges. The capture of the photo says, and it shows the worker there holding up one of the cartridges from the desert. It'd be amazing if they things. They probably still work. Anyway, here's the story. The dusty town of Almagordo in New Mexico has announced that in a series of eBay auctions, 881 of the early 1980s Atari video game cartridges that were buried for decades in the desert have sold for a grand total, as Craig mentioned before, $107,930 and, of course, the important part, 15 cents. Last April, a film crew and a dig crew hired by Fuel Entertainment and Xbox Entertainment Studios dug up the an old garbage dump outside of Alamogordo looking for Atari cartridges dumped in the fall of 1983. This is this is like you know Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, I, can you imagine yes. the uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the organization that gets hired uh, by this to go? They want to go into an old garbage dump. And look, find these things. And look for Atari cartridges back from 1983. You know, first of all, how do they, how do they know that these things were even there? I well, mean, that that that's somewhat explained in the story here. So it says the dumping was precipitated by the North American video game crash. Did I? I didn't remember this. The North American video game crash of 1983. Hmm. We need some gaming experts, history gaming folks, to tell us what that is. And the total bomb of a game that was E.T., the extraterrestrial, which was written on a rush schedule and quickly gained a reputation among Atari players of being too punishing and complex. So they, you know, take advantage of the hit movie, they rush this game. Yeah, ben, what, ben, ben, have you heard, did you ever hear of the uh, North American video game crash of 1983? Yeah, let's Google that, Ben. Yeah, let's see yeah, if it uh, comes up. That was, I think, a couple of consoles that, you know, that were popular back at the time they kind of fell through uh, from development standpoints. And, oh, really? like, there were just games getting pumped out left and right, and quality was suffering, and they just wanted to get stuff out. And, I, like, a lot of the early consoles, that, that's when that's when they fell out, and that's when, you know, the Atari, the PlayStation, like, like the big names survived. But back in the early 80s, there were a lot of in-home game consoles. Oh, yeah. Oh, how well I know. Yeah, so it and, says... when. When, it, when Atari shut down its El Paso, Texas factory that year, the company had a variety of its game cartridges, not just the ET ones, thrown out. While a brief New York Times clip from that year confirmed that Atari had dumped the games, Craig, this answers your question, Atari itself never confirmed or denied the dump of tens of hundreds or thousands of its game cartridges. Uh, so naturally, rumors grew with doubters and believers on each side. It became kind of an urban myth until the Atari ET dump became stuff of urban legend. This is but like Joe. This, this is like you know when you read about, about the, the galleons, the Spanish galleons loaded with yes, gold. yes, treasure and, hunters, and, and the rumors and and the, the, the myths around it and and what happened and the <laughs> good grief. This, these yeah. are game cartridges, and yet uh, I know it's it's it, that's why I love this story. It's got so many layers of absurdity and fun to it. So it says Joe uh, Lewandowski, <clears throat> pardon me, a garbage contractor in the Almagoro area, remembered pieces of the event, and decades later he used some careful detective work to pinpoint just where in the vast desert trove was buried, just so that he reverse engineered. So you can see the video and the links and so forth, and you can find out about that more. And then it says a small sample of cartridge, cartridges was exhumed and used in the Xbox documentary film they made. In September, the city of Alamogordo 
uh, Gordo, pardon me, decided to sell hundreds of those cartridges on eBay, including Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man, Pele's Soccer, Yar's Revenge, Baseball, Centipede, oh, I love Centipede, mm -hmm. and Warlords. Lewandowski went before the Alamogordo City Commissioners last week, and you have to look at the date of the story, and reported that the sale of the games raked in more than $100,000, $65,000 of which will go to the city. Great. Another 16000 approximately will go to the Tularosa Basin Historical Society. That's nice. Shipping fees totaled more than $26,000 and were used to send the games to buyers around the U.S. and in countries including Brazil, Australia, Singapore, France, and Canada. The most expensive sale was of an ET cartridge, which went for $1,535. Why? I don't know. Besides the cartridges <laughs> that the city of Alamogordo took charge of, the filmmakers were able to keep 100 cartridges, and 23 cartridges were given away to museums. So what a you know what a hoot! <laughs> I'm just a scratching my head here, you know, as to why. Uh, uh, well, you yeah. even have the, the 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 consoles to play these games, you know. Oh, of course you do. They look like eight-track cartridges. Oh, they do. I've got my Atari 400. I still have it. It still works. I can still fire up Pac-Man on it. <laughs> Uh, of course, they have the emulators now. The whole machine can be yeah, emulated. yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I have whole computers that I can emulate. I can have, I have my Apple II and my Apple II Plus and Apple IIe. I have an emulator that will, I can run it on my on on the Mac. So it, and and I have um, you know, you have virtual disks that you put in that have all the different software. Yeah, in it. yeah. Oh yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's just weird to think about what like what is widely considered the worst game in video game history. <laughs> And all of this mystery around it. I, I mean, it's not like it happened, you know, hundreds of years ago, and it's, you know, ancient Viking ruins. No, it's, you know, 1983. What were you doing in 1983? Listening to bad music and watching, you know, some, some gremlin movie. Or playing Atari video games. Yeah, all right, I mean, we're, we're at the top of the hour, and we're going to continue on with more stories like this. And uh, this is the Computer America Show. We've got our social media winner coming up as well. Stay with us. I'm going to be right back. Broadcasting live. It's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight. Computer America. Hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello, and welcome into Hour 2 of the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And uh, we continue on with uh, Ralph Bond uh, from Autodesk. Uh, we're doing these uh, stories that he finds for us. Uh, Ralph joins us usually uh, on the uh, second uh, Friday of the month and to talk about uh, the things that he discovers. And he's got some really interesting stories. Uh, some of them we've covered have been uh, 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 the, an exoskeleton uh, w w used by a completely paralyzed man, a quadriplegic, and uh, a football robotic tackling dummies, uh, uh, material that self-heals. Even if you fire a bullet at it, it instantly self-heals. Uh, we talked about fluid motion with robotics. Um, uh, we talked about uh, safety trucks with Samsung television screens in the back of the of an 18 wheeler, so you can see what's coming around. Just some of the stories, and uh, even uh, leaves leaves uh, generating energy. But the most bizarre one, I think, uh, all of this was the last one we did, where they unearthed 881 uh, ET cartridges buried in New Mexico desert. That wound up for selling for uh, over uh, almost $108,000. Uh, talking about a really bizarre, strange thing. But you know, collectors, I guess you know, uh, you, you, collectors are collectors if they it want. It may be a low point in video game history, but it is a point in video game history. Yeah, exactly. And and there are people out there who will buy this stuff uh, uh, to the tune of over $100,000, and yeah. and there it is. So. Uh, so we sort of followed the uh, progression of, of how they kind of detected and and, and, and what one person did to, to actually look. <laughs> it's amazing to me that things that are buried in the desert, they'll say you never know, but you know somebody somewhere out there probably knows you know where something is. 
uh, or, or certainly find it as that gentleman. Like, that's the other part that kills me, though. It's like, this happened in 1983. There's some guy that's probably still working whose job it was to bury these things yeah. out there. Like, Thank it's you. not the hidden past. No, but do they But do they keep track of of every item that they bury out in the in the desert? Or location. I, yeah, the location of... of I mean, I can understand location, but but what the item, what the garbage was, because that's just the landfill. It's garbage. What the, what the garbage items were? How do you you don't keep track of things like that? Well, we buried four hundred seventy thousand eggshells in the you know this and, and well, we those, those will have decomposed by now, Craig. You, yeah, you're well, never getting those eggshells back. No, exactly. So that that's what blows my mind is how did he know what item of garbage? I mean, I don't see the location, but how do they how do they detect that? So that to me is just mind boggling. Well, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. does that. I, I don't know. They, they, it is nuts, guys. And why not? Why didn't they think, oh, instead of putting these in the landfill, let's give them to Goodwill. Hmm. Goodwill can get them out there and, you know. <laughs> no, uh, the the Atari, it was such a failure that... Um, <laughs> They they wanted wanted to it, 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 it was such a failure that they distributed the games to the retailers. The retailers demanded that Atari buy back all of oh, their video games be, so they wouldn't make a loss on it. And then Atari, it was such a failure, such a huge... <laughs> it, it, it was like... Um, uh, what's that Mars movie that just, just came out a few years ago? John Carter? Oh, and oh, yeah. It, it, imagine that, but in video game form... <laughs> They just wanted to burn it, bury it, destroy it. Like that's that's the reason they chose this particular uh, landfill out in uh, New Mexico was because they promised to burn, bury, encase in cement all of their garbage. <laughs> they wanted this thing gone. Like, well, it, was, it wasn't gone enough because it was yeah. not gone enough. It's yeah, they, back. They, they, they claimed it and 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 at a wild wild profit. I mean, um, that kind of... I don't even know if they would sell those new. It wouldn't have sold that kind of money. <laughs> no. no well, new? Money. They couldn't sell them new. They I couldn't know, sell them new. Had they, <laughs> if they would have uh, realized that amount of money, you know, so... Well, uh, not, to, not to belabor the story, but that one cartridge, remember the one, the most expensive sale was an E.T. cartridge for $1,500, guys, for one <laughs> cartridge. What? Yeah. Right. <laughs> So they're treating them like gold. I, 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 I guess you know, it's Go just a lot. Nope. <laughs> anyway, if you missed the story, you can listen to it again. We, are, we archive all of our shows at ComputerAmerica.com. We have our archives page, uh, which you can uh, go to and, um, and uh, listen to it or watch it. We have videos of everything we're talking about. Yeah. And, of course, we have our cheat notes. Again, I encourage you to go to ComputerAmerica.com, go to today's show, just click on Ralph Bond's picture. And uh, you see it says cheat notes. Just click on that and it'll open up a Google Docs document and you can see all the images, the stories, the links. It's all there uh, for your uh, viewing pleasure. And we certainly welcome you. Again, 347-884-8881. Also the phone number if you want to call. If you have a comment, question, or suggestion about anything we're talking about today, love to hear from you. 347-884-8881. Um, or go to any page at ComputerAmerica.com. In the upper right-hand corner says submit a question. You can click on that and submit a question for us. As well, if you're radio shy, you don't want to go on the air. Um, okay, so uh, we're continuing on with the stories. Oh, uh, one person says uh, uh, here uh, says I still have two Atari 2600s and all and all of my games. So this yeah. is, this is confirms. I mean, you know, there are people out keep there collectors. You know, keep them. Who knows what what they'll be worth someday? You know, you can pass it down to your kids if you have kids <laughs> <laughs> or family members. Somebody, you know. Um, all right, well, we're continuing on, and again, you can see everything in the cheat notes, as I mentioned, or and of course, on our live video stream, you can watch, Ben is dis displaying all the uh, yeah. uh, sites and movies that you can watch at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, just go to the uh, show lounge, and you can see everything there. Uh, story nine, now, again, Ralph Bond is with Autodesk, and uh, this is a story, uh, a little has Autodesk involved with it. Uh, students use Autodesk Inventor. Uh, alias and FEM to build world's first hydrogen fuel cell powered racing car. This yeah, yeah. So this, you know, shameless plug alert. Of course, as Craig said, I work for Autodesk. So, but I, I thought this was a genuinely valid and interesting story from a technology point of view. There's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we go. And you can see the link there and so on and picture. 
of the vehicle, and then I'm going to butcher some of the German here, but hang on for a second. Earlier this spring, the FORZ, F-O-R-Z-E, student team broke the lap record for fuel cell powered vehicles on the world famous Nuremberging Nordischef track. God, I butchered that. I have no clue how to say that, fellas. Uh, known for its merciless twists and turns through the Eiffel forests. It, it is the track that every car manufacturer in the world uses to showcase the car's capabilities and stuff. With a lap time of 10 minutes and 43 seconds, the 4s 6 clocked in over a minute faster than the previous time recorded by a hydrogen fuel cell powered Nissan. Uh, and you can see the video there. There's a, there's a video you can watch. The kicker is that the 4s 6 was only running on half of the fuel cell power it is designed for. So potentially the car could go even faster. The image, if you're following the cheat notes, folks, the image under there is an inventor uh, image, not a photograph of the actual vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, Autodesk Inventor software was used to design both the general overall placing of the main components in the car as well as many of the car's details down to the brackets. Uh, brackets design, rather. The fours. Uh, here it says four, but it was six. Body design was done using Autodesk Alias software, and its suspension components were analyzed using Autodesk FEM software. Four six is the first hydrogen fuel cell powered race car in the world, so that's the qualifier, first race car. Therefore, very little information is available on how you actually make such a car. Mm. On top of that, this car has more hydrogen fuel cell power than the previous five cars combined. Given these two facts, you can probably imagine that designing this car was an enormous challenge, which it certainly was, I'm sure. Beyond going really fast and breaking world records, the student team and their professors want to introduce the world to hydrogen fuel cell options and reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. Which, by the way, today's price for a barrel of oil is down like in the Twenty dollar? I think it was a twenty or forty dollar range. Really? I know. I'm just buying them shocking. because I can. It's yeah. It's so cheap. well, yeah. There you go. And it ends here. Says with this car, the team has proven that a full size hydrogen fuel cell fuel cell powered race car can exist. Their next project is one that will demonstrate that hydrogen cars can be as fast as cars with a combustion em engine, and will prove it by going head to head with fossil fuel powered race cars. So it's just an interesting, you know step forward in the good old hydrogen powered vehicle world. You know, it's interesting, these alternative uh, uh, energy cars, I mean, uh, uh, Elon Musk with the Tesla car, uh, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. Tesla, that, that the one that he we're talking about is, is as fast or faster than any of the, uh, com uh, of the uh, fuel power, of the normal fossil fuel cars today. Uh, I mean, it goes from zero to 60 in, in like about two some, some oh, months. Gosh, yes. It's incredibly fast. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, so it it is not unreasonable to su to assume or to believe that alternative fuel uh, automobiles can and, and can be and evidently are uh, faster than fossil fuel cars that we use today. Right, right, um, right. So it just goes to show that. All right. Anyway, that that was a, a cool story. Again, again, uh, from uh, 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 using Autodesk Inventor. Um, and. Ralph, and you know, this is just getting into Autodesk as a company. You guys seem to be doing a heck of a lot. How closely do you guys work? With, and uh, I know that you really don't work with you know the department that most of the stories come from. But how closely do you work with people using your software? Because I, I assume it would be something like Adobe, where you know they just push a product out and then they're done essentially. Like they're they have the tools, you use the tools, you're you're good to go. It seems like yeah. Autodesk seems to have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies in, you know, actually helping people complete projects. Oh, yeah, that's right, Ben. And, and a software company like Autodesk, which is so interesting, of course, because it's all about design, okay? Mm -hmm. It's all about the future of making things with today's technology, which is software, the cloud, infinite computing, uh, virtually speaking, from uh, server farms in the cloud, all these things coming together. But to answer your question, it's not just, here's this product, and we walk away. We also have consultant services. We have uh, teams of experts that will work with key customers, other things of this nature to help people uh, get the most out of the software and the technology and also to show a lot of show and tell, a lot of how-to, a lot of, if you want to call it, like recipes for how to do things. So there's an enormous, spectacularly enormous worldwide effort 
to help educate and show people the, the possibilities, and not least of which, uh, over the last year or so, you may have taken note of the fact that Autodesk now makes all of its software, all of its software, <clears throat> full versions, mind you, free mm. to educators, students around the world. So there's that part of it, too, in terms of not just, not just oh, yeah, here's this wrench. Go figure it out mm. on your own. It's much more than that, folks, and so thanks, Ben, for asking that question because it, it, that's one of the things I find so fascinating about Autodesk is not just the technology but helping people out. For example, in the film industry, we, we go to there a lot because it's fun and it's exciting and you can talk about a movie like the latest Mad Max film and other things that we talked about, Gravity, all using Autodesk software, but in some cases, we will actually help. We have experts that will help the producers, uh, such as the f folks behind Avatar and the, the new Avatar coming along, uh, helping them out with uh, with their filmmaking process using our technology. So it is not just a here it is and walk away kind of environment for us. Wow. Right. Okay. Um, so we're continuing on with the the show uh, with the uh, cheat notes of Ralph Bond and this next one, uh, Story 10. Uh, again, uh, we, we talked about we, – we had uh, – uh, the people with drone. We had the uh, drone convention. Uh, what was it, Ben? Uh, oh wow! Uh, last month uh, of, that was being held out in Las Vegas. What was the name of that? Oh yeah, uh, the international. It's like the I want to say the IDC, the International Drone Conference, or something like that. But yeah. Uh, so we had the the head of the developer of the organ organization uh, yeah. of that. Well, here it is, drones again. But this is a drone. You're saying that might be best to buy for beginners. Why Absolutely. It? Oh gosh, guys, I think you're gonna love this when you and watch that video. Maybe Ben can get that video running if he hasn't already done so. Yeah, it was interdrone, by the way. It was interdrone? Inter yeah. Okay. Uh, but, well, so in the world of drones, right? This yeah. one is so well thought out. It says for beginners, that's true, that's fine. But I think it's extremely clever from a, a mechanical design point of view. So let's get into the story. It comes from uh, Quartz. Is the outlet? The author is Mike Murphy. And the headline, as Craig said, is this might be the best new drone to buy for beginners, but I think it's just great all the way around. But let's get into the story. You can see if you have the cheat notes, you see the beautiful photo of it. It's good. It's fun to look at. And already you may have detected some things that are going to be highlighted here in the story that make it a, a really very clever, very smart design. And then it shows uh, there's a little image there of the video, and you can see that. And then here's the story. Quartz, so they had a chance to try this out. So it's Quartz flew a late stage prototype of the Snap with Vantage founder, so the product's called Snap, uh, with, and Vantage is the company, founder Tobin Fisher in August. So they had a chance to play with this thing in August last month. Fisher demonstrated that anyone with an iPhone or Android phone should be able to fly the Snap, even if you have no experience or if you've tried and crashed other drones in the past. Press a button on the Snaps app and the engines start up. So you're using your smartphone, right? You can picture this. Uh, tilt the phone forward and it'll zip out of your hand and into the sky. Tilt it to the right and it goes to the right. It's as easy as playing a game on your phone or I would liken it to you know dealing with your Wii controller. That kind of experience, right? Mm -hmm. Vantage's custom-made guards around the propeller blades. Go back to the picture. Notice the kind of bicycle spoky wheelie kind of thing around those propeller, propeller blades? Yeah. Vantage's custom-made guards around the propeller blades, which look more like bike wheels than propellers, make the snap safe to hold in your hand and grab as it returns to you. If you've ever played with drones, folks, you got to watch out for those props, right? Yeah. <laughs> the snap weighs about one pound, and while it's still – it'll – that uh, – pardon me – and while that, it'll still hurt you if it fell on you, the drone is designed to break apart. Key point, the drone is designed to break apart on impact, which would lessen the blow or injury, and then can be put to back together. The snap is held together by a series of strong magnets. Now, I'm the son of a mechanical engineer. I cannot tell you the admiration, the thoughtfulness, how clever, how brilliantly simple and often genius is simple, right? I, I just think this is wonderful. Well, I'm, watching, the drone, I'm watching a video of him actually yeah. unfolds the fan blades. They uh, they fold yeah. them, and then he he puts the motor on top, and he puts yeah. the back and the clips on bottom with any they just clip together, and it's off. It's just the most simplistic thing. And he carried the whole thing in a little backpack. 
Amen. Isn't that, guys, again, from a mechanical engineering point of view, hooray. I mean, this should get an award and probably has. So it says that the drone's propeller base folds up, as Craig was alluding to, allowing it to fit even in the smallest backpack. Fisher reminded us of the adage that the best camera is the one you have on you, saying he wanted to build a drone that was small enough and easy enough to operate that you could carry it around with you all the time, just like our smartphones, right? Right. It comes with a built-in stabilizing, get this, it comes with a built-in stabilizing 4K camera, so yeah. ultra high def, right? 20 minutes of flight time and and some of the same tricks you'll find in on flagship models, meaning much more expensive. The drone can be programmed to quickly orbit around someone holding the controls or track them as they move. Snap has been pre-ordered. Uh, for $895 from Vantage's website, and Fisher said it will ship to the first customers in the spring of next year. After the pre-order period, it will cost $1,295, around the same price as a Phantom, as well as 3D Robotics Solo Drone, so it's kind of comparing them to different products in the marketplace. But guys, I just fell in love with the design. Magnetically held together, snapped together parts, safety blades, these guys thought it through. I just think it's a stunning product. And I agree and disagree. Yes, for beginners, but really, this is going to help greatly democratize zones in business use because that price tag of 895 or 1200 bucks for a business is a, is a doable amount of money, right? Maybe individual consumers, that's a pretty steep chunk of change. But gosh, guys, imagine being able to say, here, use your, here's a smartphone and go out there. Let's, get a, let's run that drone up on the side of the building here and inspect that thing that we can't see unless we get tons of ladders and so forth. And uh, wow, I mean, my uh, daughter's boyfriend works in construction and this kind of thing would be spectacular for those guys. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I've heard a lot of stories of uh, of photographers, uh, wedding yeah. photographers, event photographers, things like that. If you could just pull this thing out and be like, you know, it's safe. Don't worry about it. Might get in your hair, but it probably won't. You know, don't have to worry about anyone getting a finger chopped off. And just and with that, that's a high powered camera. You know, that's that's nothing yeah. to you know to play. You know, well, it's yes, it is something to play around with. And uh, <laughs> you know, for photographers, this seems like a very not agree. so expensive, great entry point into drones. Totally agree, and I, I think this is one of the, to my, and I've been around drones, you guys have too, this is probably the most innovative design overall in its category and for its purpose that I've seen today. I just salute to these guys. Yeah, very, very clever. Very clever. And uh, it'll be available soon, as you say. Okay. Um, I want to skip down to story 15. And, okay. And then we'll continue on. Uh, you all remember Polaroid, right? <laughs> well, uh, they're back, and not only are they back, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're back to its Instamatic days. Uh, snap, the Snap Digital Camera. Uh, this is actually very clever and very. <laughs> I like this. So tell us about this. Uh, Product. Yeah, this one's a quirky consumer product. So along with all this highfalutin science and everything that we've been having fun with, this, this is all well and good. But this is this is kind of fun because I'm a nostalgic guy. Polaroid cameras were a big, big, big deal in my childhood. Oh, my, we could have a picture right away. Oh, and as a little kid, my job was to pull the thing out, pull the deal up, lay it down and Watch and then, it develop. And then, had, and then you had to put the fixer on it to make sure that... Yes, the fixer. It was like this gummy you know, roller thing or something, right? Craig, that's a good memory. I, I forgot it, about that. Exactly. And then they were all... It was black and white at first. Yes. Like that one. Uh, of course, later, then my generation was the SX-70, and that made the cover of Life magazine. <laughs> uh, the, that, the SX-70 was the first one. Like, and it would just... Pop out of the front, and it was dry, and it was, and then of course they had all kinds of variations. So uh, you, Alpha, and I both grew up with Polaroid. Yeah, right? yeah, oh yeah, and and to put it into perspective for Ben and younger listeners, the whole thing about Polaroid, the reason it just took off like crazy, is once upon a time, photography was a point, click, wait. Exactly. You didn't right. Have you yeah. had to take the roll of film to the, the pharmacy and you know, yeah. a you week later, out. whatever it was. Polaroid blew the socks off of the whole idea of, quote-unquote, instant gratification, instant response. You yeah. know, you're at the family wedding. You're at this, and you can see in a few minutes, and it wasn't instant, but in a few minutes you would see the results of the photo you took and say, oh, we better retake that picture. 
because it didn't turn out or whatever in the age of our smartphones and instant constant selfies and all of the we take this for granted but once upon a time it was quite a big deal so this story comes from geek.com a story by Lee Matthews the link is in this the show notes for you snap digital camera takes Polaroid back to its Instamatic days. There's a great little photograph of these little tiny pocket cameras. Very retro. Very retro. The little multicolored stripe thing is very kind of um, late 70s in my mind. Anyway, it says at the start of the millennium, it looked like the Polaroid brand was doomed. Now it's making a comeback, and it has everything to do with nostalgia. The latest camera to bear the Polaroid name. It's actually the work of a company called CNA Marketing, a brand licensing outfit. Is the cheap and cheerful snap. And by the way, I'm going to stop for a second because you, you, you fellas know from all the photo um, apps you can get for your smartphones and so forth, they have a lot of different filters. And some of the filters either point blank reference Polaroid or try to imitate a Polaroid like effect, right? right? So there is this nostalgia. Even the younger generation kind of gets it that they want their photos to look like those 70s kind of pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what's going on here with this nostalgia thing. So it says snap isn't like other digital point and shoots on the market. It's built for fun and shareability, but in an old school Polaroidy way. <laughs> Instead of using built in Wi Fi to zip your pictures off Facebook friends, you can print out a copy and actually hand it to them on the spot. The 10 megapixel shooter, that's pretty good uh, resolution. Yeah. The 10 M MP shooter also has a cool photo booth mode. Switch it on, and the snap captures six pictures in ten seconds, very much like those machines at the mall do. That's kind of fun. It says, it's a lot like an updated version of the Polaroid Land Camera 1000. You can even switch to a vintage color mode to give your pics that classic Polaroid tone. That's what I was alluding to in some of the filters that are out there in, in other apps. There's no display on the back. You frame your shots through an optical viewfinder. Well, it's just like we had to do in the old days. <laughs> and if you want to see your, your print, you have to print it out or plug the snap into your computer. That's a nice option. You don't have to pause to do it either. You can keep shooting while it's printing your pics. That's cool too. Like other cameras with built-in printing capabilities, the snap utilizes an inkless system that relies on Zinc's special paper. It's been around for years and has been cons uh, the consumable of choice for numerous Polaroid brand products, including the Pogo cameras and printers that are referring to the zinc paper guys. The Snap's prints measure 2 inches by 3 inches, and they should fit nicely in your wallet. There's one major difference between the Snap and other Polaroid branded cameras with integrated printers. It's price tag. The Snap will retail for 99 bucks close to half the cost of the Z2300 model uh, Polaroid. So, you know, just a fun, quirky kind of story. And uh, there, is a, there is a kind of a, uh, to me, it's like my son uh, being now fascinated with vinyl discs and turntables. Of course, <laughs> the, in his milieu, his generation of uh, the music pilks, they're, they're all about the sound quality. He wants an amplifier with real tubes and all this. Because they, they, they've gone into this thing of uh, believing, and I, I'm not just saying it's bad or anything, but there, there's a belief that that kind of stereo equipment that I grew up with as a teenager, all tube-based and everything like that, was somehow better. And they, they certainly think the guitar amps have a richer, warmer, deeper sound. This is like the photo version of that. There's a certain element of the market that wants this nostalgia. Yeah, and I thought it was I thought it was very interesting. I like our listeners yeah. to hear about it. Uh, so you know, a, f uh, a film technically is pretty much dead, but you know, it's it's, it's there. Dead. There's something just special. I think that kids are are just now, you know, seeing mm -hmm. having something physical, something that you can touch, that you can pass someone else. You know, mm -hmm. it, it digital is great for you know sharing it and distributing it and that kind of thing, but having something physical in your hand. That's you know something you really don't get too often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, Ben. It's like it's like, oh, you know, it was an interesting experience to sit across from you, Dad, face to face in the flesh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, a terrific story, and uh, <clears throat> that was fun. All right, let's move on to the story sixteen, the next one down there. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of interesting for uh, YouTube. Uh, uh, basically. YouTube made the announcement, and you can now get 4K videos with YouTube. 
it's available. Do that. Well, evidently, uh, according to the story, a very clever Google algorithm could make a 4K video half the size. That's interesting. Oh yeah, so this is a technology progression thing. If if you think about the history of video compression and so forth, MPEG and Silverlight from Microsoft. Well, by the way, I think Silverlight is stunning. Just right. blows my mind. But here we have this story uh, from Gizmodo, story by Chris Mills. The headline, as you said, is a clever Google algorithm can make 4K, which is ultra high def, folks, video half the size, file size. Why is this important? Because of course, guys. In the and people in the audience, you 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 can either push a gigantic 50 billion pound log through the tube of the internet, or you can have it be half the size, and obviously it's going to be more efficient and faster because yeah. bandwidth is everything in in the world of streaming video, right? Right. So here the story says the internet, in one form or another, is becoming more and more about video. Boy, is that so true! At peak times, Netflix and YouTube alone account for wait for it, half of all web traffic. Now, I presume they mean in North America, uh, but I, I could be wrong, but I, I'm kind of guessing that's really more for North America. That's an understandably huge burden for, in, uh, for service providers to carry, right, for Internet ser service providers. But as well as making the pipes bigger, we can also shrink down what goes through them. That's really where technology is all about. Compression's always been about you got a, a straw a certain size. How yeah. can I make the stuff going through it smaller and at the other end deliver an uncompromised and great experience? So that's the whole game of video and audio compression, guys. There it is. In the right, and I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you what, we're going to continue uh, on with this story and uh, others uh, when we come back. Uh, we're going to be talking about the next third generation Nest Learning uh, thermostats are here and also um, we're going to talk about SanDisk uh, has a wireless stick that's uh, a 120 gigabyte file server in a thumb drive. These stories and more coming up here on the show. Also, we're going to be giving away the uh, uh, our social media winner of the week. We're going to be giving away that Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse about at $80. But we're going to take a quick break and then we'll continue on with these stories and more with Ralph Vaughn. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Ben, I, and Ralph will be back. Uh, we've got another new Sysbulls review from Marty Winston. Uh, coming up as well. Stay with us. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control, where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably hungry, or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door-to-door, -door, neighborhood by neighborhood, to educate citizens about local resources available for at-risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community-based approach to no Kill helps keep family pets healthy, happy, and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place. For more information or to make a tax-deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization, visit their website at www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? <laughs> We'll be right 
No, there's no fun at political parties. Oh, hi, it's Marty Winston with the News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, Loom. A gizmo the size of a pocket lighter has a flip-down plug for a smartphone's audio jack, a flip-around mouthpiece into which you blow, and a small, fairly quiet siren that lets you hear how steadily you're blowing. This is Flume, F-L-O-O-M-E, an Italian-designed product that essentially smells the alcohol on your breath and reports to a free companion app. The app warns if you're over the limit for your current locale and gives you the option of phoning a friend or calling for a taxi, or it can estimate how long it will take you to sober up. Bottom line, even people who won't believe friends who say they're too drunk to drive can get the truth from a flume and maybe survive. Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Thank you, Marty Winston, for that News Tips Bulletin Review. And, uh, yeah, as we promised before and as we've been promising all week, we are at that time to give away a... Uh, a mouse, a, Log a Logitech MS, or MX Anywhere 2 mouse, that's it, uh, to a lucky Twitter follower yeah. of Computer America. So, All right. without further stalling for time. Let's do it. All right. Uh, this week's social media winner is... Michael Bernardi. Michael Bernardi, congratulations. Michael listens to us in San Diego, California, and he wins the Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse. It's, uh, it's got uh, the dark field technology, so you can use it on glass surfaces. Um, you can um, also at the, you can pair up to three computers with the one mouse and switch between them with the touch of the button thanks to its easy switch technology. Again, valid at $80. Uh, congratulations to you, Michael Bernardo. You're this week's social media winner uh, of the week. And again, go to ComputerAmerica.com and uh, register for, for all of them. Just view all of our social medias and sign up. Uh, like them, sign up for them. And each, you only have to do it one time and, and you just add them. And every week you have that many more entries per week uh, to win a really nice prize from Logitech. All right, so uh, we're talking to Ralph Bond. And uh, we're talking about this clever Google algorithm that can make uh, your 4K video half the size that it is. And uh, why don't you continue where we left off? We can't hear you, Ralph. You have if I here. unmute myself, there we yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those Logitech mice are wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I have I have tons of them. They're just great product, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were talking about a story from Gizmodo. A clever Google algorithm can make 4K video half the size. And the, before the break, we were talking about why this is significant from a streaming video point of view. So we'll pick up and carry on. It goes on to say video codecs. Oh, quiz time. Now, you guys know the answer, so it's unfair. But maybe some in the audience might pipe in magically and tell us. Codex, C-O-D-E-C-S. What does it stand for? Do you know? I do. I do. <laughs> okay, we'll give it away. It's compression decompression right? Yeah. So this is the whole name of the game with audio and video. So video compression, decompression uh, are the clever algorithms that take raw video data and shrink it down to a manageable amount of data. Every codec is a trade-off between preser preserving quality and decreasing file size, but not all codecs are created equal. Far from it, in fact. This is so true. Uh -huh. Uh, over on the YouTube developer blog, and there's a link in the notes here for you to go there, uh, Google, ha Google has a fantastic and very easy to understand post on the benefits of its VP9 video codec, the technology that's already being used to stream YouTube videos to some users. According to Google, VP9 cuts the file size of a video in half, meaning where you previously could stream 480p video over your crummy connection, which is a terrible resolution, by the way, guys, mm -hmm. you'll now be able to get 720p, which is tolerable, you know, the low end, but of high def, right? Right. Unlike many codecs that came before it and continue to challenge it, the VP9 codec is an open source standard. Very important. Means any, anybody can help, you know, contribute to it, right? Yeah. Open source, open source and royalty free means free to use. Free to use means the tech is far more likely to be built into web browsers and smartphones and used by video giants like Netflix. Ultimately, 
That means prettier, faster loading videos for you and your grandma. I don't know why grandma figures into this, but hey, that's cool. Where's grandpa in this? Anyway, for you and your grandma, and cheaper internet bills for your for YouTube, so fewer ads now, pretty please. It's a little joke, nod, and wink from the author of this article. Not bad for fundamentally a clever bit of mathematics. And then you can go and look at the YouTube developer blog. And by the way, since we're talking about Netflix, I have to ask or share this with the audience and you guys. You know me, I'm Mr. Heart Guy, and I'm on my treadmill, and I have what I call my treadmill shows. Mm -hmm. My latest treadmill show is a Netflix original production, maybe you've heard of it, called Narcos. Yes, I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the drug uh, cartels. And, uh, Absolutely, about Pablo Escobar. And oh, wow, folks. I highly recommend it. Now, you have to be adept at reading subtitles because it's all in Espanol, but uh, with exception of when the American DEA agents are speaking English, of course, it's hmm. not. But, I mean, it, it is so well done. I'm about halfway through it. Wow. Got to recommend that. And the video quality is spectacular hmm. uh, on my Netflix and my Amazon Prime these days. I'm so pleased with the way they keep improving the technologies. So it relates a bit to this story, but I wanted to share my, my latest treadmill show, Narcos. <laughs> now, we, uh, we did a story here on the show uh, uh, about a week ago, I think, where between Google, Netflix, uh, Time Warner, I believe was one of them, uh, there were quite a few very, very large names that were getting behind a joint committee of creating the next video standard for... You know, internet video. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and yeah, that's you know they, they just announced it, and they're probably still working on it, so we won't see any fruit from that labor for a while. But this seems to you know kind of harken back to that where all of the large video players you know on the internet seem to be getting together and trying to whittle that data down because obviously right. it's least as it is. So everyone's getting together and saying, okay, guys, we need to streamline this, make it more efficient. Because right now, it's just not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're so right, Ben. Yeah. And the other thing that uh, I'm, I'm wondering about is, uh, uh, and again, when you, and the, cause there's all kinds of compression. There's video compression. There's audio compression. There's pictures compression. Anybody who's used a JPEG understands what uh -huh. picture right. compression is. But there are different types. There, um, there uh, for example, when, and, uh, there's MP3 uh, uh, is audio compression. We use it mostly for our music. But uh, Apple started to use uh, something which was called the lossless compression. Right. Um, so basically, even though the file was smaller, you didn't lose any of the quality. Uh, uh, image is the same thing, lossless compression. They have it uh, where you, you don't have the seesaw effect. Well, if you get more compression, but the image starts to suffer. You can. Right. There are techniques to do that. Uh, I'm wondering if this particular V9 compression is lossless or lossy means that, that you lose some but not much. Uh, if oh. you see those compressions uh, techniques, or uh, uh, because it sounds like you're losing half the, the image, because from 480 to 720, you know, in the example that they gave, I'm not mm -hmm, sure right. uh, if it's uh, how how much is affecting the uh, the high quality 4K video. So uh, yeah, so that would be interesting to see demonstrated. To your point, that would be really interesting. Okay. All right. Well, we we I don't, we're not we're not going to have enough time to get to all the story, <laughs> but there are a few here that I want to mention. Um, um, uh, now, probably right now, this next one is story seventeen. Uh, the third generation Nest learning thermostat arrives for about two hundred forty nine dollars, uh, and uh, they they everybody pretty much understands Nest, and they make these beautiful thermostats. They're digital. They're they're easy to install. Uh, so what is this? What is this third generation? Uh, what are they offering with this now? Yeah, it definitely is a step forward. This comes from Ars Technica website. And the link is in the story there. Uh, there's a great little image shows a very attractive display, which, as to your point, Craig, looks familiar. Uh, looks very much like the previous generation. So here's the scoop, though, on why this third generation is interesting. It says uh, new Nest, the new Nest uh, thermostat has a bigger, higher resolution screen, and can also now act as a wall clock. That's a nice little touch. Uh, Nest has announced a new version of the Nest learning thermostat. Of course, that's part of their heritage. One of the things about the product line that's so cool is the learning feature, right? The third generation of the company's smart home device. The new version of the Nest has a larger, higher resolution screen, slimmer profile, that's nice, and an updated user interface. 
The display is 40% larger than the previous Nest. Boy, as I get older, I need that too. I need, you know, bigger, bigger, please. With 25% more pixels, Nest says the display is now up to 229 pixels per inch. With the new display, Nest is adding a Farsight feature to the thermostat which turns the display on whenever it detects motion in a room and displays useful information. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. The Nest will display an analog clock, a digital clock if you prefer, or the current temperature. I'd like the temperature. That's what I'd be interested in. Nest says it can be read from across the room. They don't specify the distance, but you know, I think the point is well made being a larger display, and I think that's great. It says, previously, the Nest display would only turn on when someone was standing in front of it. But Farsight is an extension of this that covers the whole room. Good. Good idea. Yeah. Then there's the new feature, Furnace Heads Up, is a new feature that checks for shutoff patterns in a heating or forced air furnace that could indicate a problem. Mm -hmm. Huh. That's interesting. Most furnaces will shut off automatically to prevent overheating. And twice a year, Nest will scan these patterns and alert the user if it finds a problem. Ooh, I like those analytics. That's kind of cool. The third gen Nest is available online today, but the story's been out for a while, so it's online right now at Nest, N E S T, of course, dot com, and Amazon for $249 and will hit retail stores soon. And I think I just saw it at Home Depot recently, so it may be out there in the field already. The second generation Nest gets a price drop to $199 while supplies last. But boy, after reading this feature, folks, if you're thinking about this kind of a product, I'd certainly go yeah. for this later generation. Obviously. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Okay, and then this, uh, 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 right along here, I want this next story, 18, uh, SanDisk. It now can, allows you to connect their wireless stick. They, they, the, the SanDisk Connect wireless stick, that's what it's called, is a 128-gigabyte gig, file server in a thumb drive. Yeah, okay. yeah. Clever. That headline grabbed me right away. Geek.com story by another story here by Lee Matthews. And you can see the photograph here. It says in the image it says stream to three devices at once, regardless of platform. No internet required. Yeah. Now there's a lot of personal and business uses where this could be very attractive, that premise alone. Again, stream to three devices at once, regardless of platform, no internet required. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. So the story says it's not hard to eat up all the internal storage on your smartphone or tablet. Amen. Thankfully, some devices come with a micro SD slot for expansion. Apple, would you please, please. <laughs> I know all the historic reasons why you don't want to do this, but that's the one thing I don't like about my iPad. I digress. The story goes on to say plenty don't, though. Unfortunately, SanDisk has a convenient solution for smartphones like the iPhone, Nexus phones, and Samsung's Gallery S6, and it doesn't stick out at the bottom of your phone. Nope. The Connect wireless stick looks a whole lot like an ordinary thumb drive. That's because it is a thumb drive, but there's more to it. It's also a portable network attached storable pardon me, storage device with built-in 802.11n Wi-Fi that can pump out content to three connected devices at the same time. Its built-in lithium-ion battery can keep it running for about four and a half hours before recharging. That's pretty good. Uh, SanDisk already offered wireless sticks, but this one is their largest yet with 128 gigs of storage. There's room for an entire road trip worth of media, and it's still small enough to dangle from your keychain. They're priced aggressively, too. The 128 gig stick sells for $99, while smaller capacities, 16, 32, and 64 bit, uh, gigabit, uh, by, pardon me, are listed for $24.99, $39.99, and $59.99 respectively. So again, the price ranges here are not bad, particularly if you're a business user. This could be really great. A hard drive like one from Seagate's Wireless Plus series will give you a whole lot more storage for roughly the same amount of money. So they're talking about another comparable path you could take. Right. The one terabyte model costs about 40 bucks more than a 120 gigabytes connected wireless stick. It also runs a lot longer with a battery that's rated for around 10 hours of continuous use. But it concludes still, and here's the key, especially for business traveling people, still, if pocketability, small form factor, right, is key to you, 
SanDisk's new Connect, Connect Wireless Stick is about the smallest private cloud server you can buy, which you can do from their online shop, Best Buy, or Amazon. So I thought it was a clever product, priced reasonably great. I think my first thought immediately was business users, to be honest with you. I think it'd be just terrific. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, and that's and so reasonably priced. You know? mm -hmm. I and think the, it is, uh, considering. Yeah. 140 bucks for, for a terabyte on a stick. That's very, very good. Yeah, right. for the alter, that's a different for the Seagate product. That's the different kind of product. Yeah. That's a hard uh, yeah, right, hard right. drive product with a battery and so forth. So he was saying, hey, another way you could go is that Seagate product, which I agree with you is very uh, reasonably priced. But it's going after a little different demographic here. If you want that pocket ability, that right, that okay. really small form factor, that's where you want to go with the SanDisk product. And I think I, I agree with that conclusion. So it's a good good couple of good products to look at if you're looking for that kind of portability and having your own cloud right. uh, server, as it were. Yeah. All right. Well, now, again, we're not going to get to all the stories, but here's one for all you Apple pundits out there who, you know, who have been lamenting and wanting an Apple Watch, but you couldn't quite, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, evidently, uh, there is an alternative for you because most <laughs> other alternative watches only work with Android, but evidently Google is coming out with a, a Google-powered luxury watch, and that really looks nice. That works with the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. This story comes from Business Insider, which has great technology stories, by the way. It's a wonderful outlet. A uh, story by Lisa Edeticcio. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and you've got the picture there. There's kind of a traditional gold-looking uh, man's uh, watch. Uh, you can see a little display image on there. And here's the story. It says, smartwatches that run on Android Wear, Google software for smartwatches, are only compatible with Android phones and tablets. Now, however, it looks like, it looks like there's one Android Wear watch that will work with the iPhone. The pre-order page, and there's a link built in here, for Huawei's, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, H-U-A-W-E-I is the name of the company, Huawei's new luxury smartwatch, which starts at $350, just like the Apple Watch, recently went live on Amazon. So you can probably check this out on Amazon or use the link in the story. In the item description, it says the watch is compatible with iOS 8.2 or Android 4.3 or later, so it can work with either Android or iOS, see, mm -hmm. suggesting that it can pair with, that it can pair with an iPhone. What's interesting to me, though, guys, I'll stop for a second, is you, you got to wonder if this were to become very popular, Apple might put something in the next rev of the OS that would kind of block it and say, no. you're not a real legit iWatch, uh, buddy. Back off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the new Huawei, <laughs> yeah, it could happen. The new Huawei watch is a high-end smartwatch that comes in gold-plated stainless steel varieties. The most expensive model shown up to the right, shown in our show notes, is 800 bucks. Oh my goodness! Google has announced uh, Google has not announced any plans to make Android Wear compatible with the iPhone. But The Verge, another outlet, another news outlet, reported back in April that the company was close to making it happen. This is notable for iPhone owners simply because there is a more limited selection of available smartwatches that work with the iPhone. If you have an iPhone, your choices are basically limited to the Apple Watch and the Pebble. But if Huawei's pre-order is any indication of Google's plans, it seems like iPhone owners are about to get more choices. We, uh, the article concludes by saying we reached out to Google for comment and we'll update this post accordingly when we hear more back. I think the real nut of this is can you really have a viable set of wearables that work with your iPhone that aren't blessed by Apple, are not coming from Apple, and how long, how viable can they be when the OS progresses and perhaps they put in little um, checks that will block out non-Apple uh, watches? I don't know. We'll see. But certainly I can imagine it would be nice to have more choice. More competition would be a good thing. It would be. Uh, uh. <laughs> um we we have maybe a couple more minutes, so I want to go back up to story 14 because uh, we haven't done anything about 3D printing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, for, it's a kind of unusual for me because usually I obsess on 3D printing. <laughs> yeah. uh, this story 14, Doctor in Gaza Strip designs a world-class yes. 3D printed stethoscope for just 30 cents. Yeah, yeah. Isn't yeah. that something? And this comes from one of my favorite websites if you're into the whole 3D printing world. And I usually in my shows with you guys have tons of 3D printing stories. And it wasn't because they weren't there. I just thought, no, let's change it up a little bit. But anyway, this comes from 3dprint.com. Really check it out. If you're interested in 3D print uh, printing, it's a great resource. The story is by Bridget Butler Millsaps. 
And as Craig said, the headline is Doctor and Gaza Strip Designs World Class 3D Printed Stethoscope for 30 cents. What? Mm -hmm. And you can see the picture here. Uh, Story is interesting. Uh, Tarek Lubani is responsible for a device that surely could change life for emergency medical personnel in the Gaza Strip, for example, or in any place where sure. is third world situations, not the Gaza Strip is third world, but you get my point. The emergency physician has not only uh, 3D printed a functional stethoscope, which would probably be enough in itself considering the conditions, but his device costs only 30 cents to make. And in testing, here's the, here's the kicker, and in testing has actually outperformed the world's best equipment that comes at a price tag of about $200. What? There's a quote here. Uh, quote, I had to hold my ear to the chests of victims because there were no good stethoscopes, and that was a tragedy, a travesty, and unacceptable, Dr. Labani said. Uh, he told Chaos Communications Camp in Germany and so forth and so on. He goes on to say, we made a list of these things that if I could bring them into the Gaza strip world, uh, into the third world in which I work and live, then I felt like I could change the lives of my patients. Inspired by his, now here's the funny part, and, and as a kid, we some of us had the little doctor kits, right? Yeah. So he was inspired by his nephew's ru rudimentary toy stethoscope, which he uh, enviously discovered had a surprisingly <laughs> good functionality. Lubani decided to pursue making his own and improve it, of course. Thanks to the uh, GLIA, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, G-L-I-A, free medical hardware project, there's a link in our notes, emanating from GitHub, medical professionals were able to work together to begin creating what they need rather than waiting for tools and supplies to miraculously fall from the sky. This is part of the whole maker movement too, right guys? Yeah, wow, uh, I just love uh, it. That, that one is a, a, a GitHub and it's a, it's a repository for people to put code for oh, readers, thanks. websites, like just any kind of code you can put into GitHub. Oh, that's cool. Thanks, Ben. And then it concludes, it says, in collaboration with the GLIA team, Lubani was able to put the device into research and development with an initial investment of $10,000 United States currency. The stethoscope project, along with all of GLIA, is open source. And Lubani and the group of medical professionals, technology specialists, and talented hackers hope to see his this design and others spread the seeds of self-sustainability throughout developing countries. So, you got maker movement, you got 3D printing, you got collaboration, you got all this great stuff coming together to create something that could help medical professionals and uh, their their assistants throughout the world, where cost is a terrible prohib a prohibitive thing. I mean, a stethoscope. $200, now $0.30, cents, and it works, and actually, in some cases, they believe is comparable to or beats the $200 job. Imagine that. <laughs> you know, it's things like what we see uh, uh, th uh, 3D printing really, really starting to come into its own. I mean, yeah. uh, let's face it, 3D printing was basically a, uh, a lab or science experiment, and, and, and you could do some you know esoteric things, but now right. printing is moving itself into... The construction industry, industry and the medical industry. Uh, so, you know, I, well, mean, I mean, 3D printing has been around for decades, like oh, literally decades. Yeah. So, but but it's now just moving into the. I won't even say consumer. Uh, well, yeah, consumers, but you know, just more the. You know, this one little job. You don't need a whole factory with multi-million dollars of investing in these high-priced right. machines to 3D print. Now it's just you know, everyone can do exactly. It was exactly. Well, again, uh, if you want to see more, all the other stories, we didn't get to the, the Second Life creator. Uh, Linden Lab starts its virtual reality world project, Sensar. There are a whole bunch of stories that we just didn't get to it. Uh, scientists map 3D atomic structures for brain signaling. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're all there, and you can certainly read all of them uh, on the show notes at, at, that Ralph puts together for us. Uh, Ralph, we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, what's going on with you and uh, Autodesk? I always ask you for... Oh, sure, yeah. The big news for Autodesk this past week has been our announcement that we're moving all of our solutions to a subscription uh, mode. We've been doing some subscription things in the past, of course, but now we've made the decision that everything we do going forward uh, starting next year will be on a subscription basis. So if you're interested in that, if you're an Autodesk user or a follower of the industry and want to learn more about that, come out to Autodesk.com, go to our newsroom, you'll find some announcements and other information that talk about that. And I think it's a sign of the time to talk about subscription software. Yeah. Uh, I believe Microsoft guys, didn't they just announce that Office 2016? Yes. Uh -huh. I think, coming soon, right? Well, 
I'm an Office 365 subscriber. You're going to get that. I, mm -hmm. I just what I love about this now is it's like I don't have to think, I don't have to do anything. It just boom, it's going to happen, yeah. and it'll be fun to see what hopefully improvements and other gro groovy little things might come along for the ride. Yeah. And uh, that takes care of me and my wife and uh, several of our systems here in our home. So it's great. We actually talked about that on the on the on our. Oh. Yeah, right. so if you're lost 365, you, you're all set. And then the, yeah, I know. Ralph, I, Ralph, I want to thank you so much for being with us here. Stay to the end. But Ralph Bond, again, with Autodesk, and uh, we look forward to having you on our next show in uh, October. Yeah, which, great. Which will be October the 9th, and we'll see you again at 3 p.m. with some more really good stuff. Thanks, Ralph, for being with us here on the show. Um, coming up uh, to, uh, on Monday, we're going to have a company called uh, Boglo, B O G G. Hello, Boglo, looks like. Basically, it's a smart peer-to-peer -peer marketplace exclusive to college students. So basically, you can get what you need faster uh, or finally cash out on a textbook collection that's suddenly growing under your bed. Uh, you can get, you can sell so many things you want to for free, no upload fee, no commission. Oh, and buyers, you can use the, their system to negotiate the price down and pay online. It's really a very cool system. It's called Boglo, and we're going to have the company's uh, CEO uh, on the uh, show for uh, uh, for uh, uh, that interview. He's going to be here again 3 p.m. Sounds for, nice. Yeah, I got Andres Cohen is going to be the CEO. And then in the second hour, uh, a company called You Break, I Fix. <laughs> 90 seconds. Uh, basically, uh, they seem right up our alley because we yeah. love to break. Yeah, they break. And, and the, because we're all obsessed about gadgets and gizmos. Well, they're going to talk about what they do. They actually fix these devices and do it and do it at an equitable rate. And, uh, and he'll talk about why they do it. And uh, basically, you have something broken that's a consumer electronic, they can, they can fix it for you. Uh, we're going to have the company's uh, uh, CEO uh, on the show uh, as well for You Break, I Fix. Coming up on Monday, seconds. John West West Weatherill. So we're going to be on the show. Anyway, that wraps it up. Everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you so much for being here with us on the show. Uh, you know, catch a movie, do something fun. Uh, and uh, and uh, Ben and I will see you here, same time, same station, same place, talking to Boglo and You Break I Fix. So again, thanks to Ralph Bond for being here with us. And again, congratulations to our winner, Michael Bernardi, for our social media winner. And Ben and I will see you here, same time, same channel, same place, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So until Monday afternoon, this is Craig Crossman, hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you Monday afternoon. Ten seconds. We get the Friday night off. Yeah, we do. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, everybody, again, everybody is watching us on our live streaming video. Thanks again for being here with us, and Ralph, and uh, we'll, we'll see you here on Monday with, uh, with our guests, and, uh, which is Boglo and You Break, I Fix. <laughs> so, have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. See you Monday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Everyone. Bye.